let me welcome you to Gettysburg National Military Park and the 155th anniversary of the battle itself. Uh, we're here on July 2nd, the second day of the battle. Uh, you've, if you've gone through the real time program, uh, you've learned a little bit about how the battle got started. You learned about Colonel Cross and the fighting down the wheat field. What this program focuses on is the attack uh, by General William Barksdale and his Mississippi Brigade. And one thing I want to point out here, and we'll get into this a little bit later, is the 21st Mississippi of the Brigade will be the right flank regiment in the Brigade line. And they're going to be moving through this area down towards the Tulsa farm behind us with their historic encounter with Bigelow's 9th Massachusetts Battery. And then they continue past that, and just to the left of the board, you can see an artillery position out there. There's, if there's a marker with two cannons on either side. That's the battery the 21st is going to capture before wow. they're finally stopped and driven back. So I just want to give you an idea of how far the 21st Mississippi is going to go, okay? What we're actually going to do is leave this area, come behind us to the monument of the 73rd New York, and that will give us a better view of Barksdale's advance, and then we'll simply turn around and see where he's going from this area. And if it, ain't, it is scheduled to be about a 30 minute program, uh, if I start going over 7 o'clock, uh, someone kind of waves our hand, and I'll try to bring it to a close. Because uh, we want to make sure you get to the Pennsylvania Monument by 7.30 for the next portion of the real-time program, uh, which is about Willis Brigade. No, the 1st Minnesota. The 1st Minnesota. So let's head back to the 73rd New York and talk about Barksdale and his brigade's attack. Get that sunset march out to Plumber. Yeah. This is the only monument where the soldiers are holding hands. <laughs> okay. There are two terrain features I want to point out. First of all, back here to my right front, that big hill is Big Round Top. So just to the left of that, over the trees, is Little Round Top. Now, if you look on the other side here, we've got that big monument with the dome on the angel on top. That's the Pennsylvania monument, okay? If you come north or to the left of that, you see a tall monument, like a miniature worse than a monument. Okay, that's the monument to the U.S. Regulars. In between those, there's a slightly smaller uh, shaft, and that's the column for the Vermont Brigade. And it's hard to see, but there is a statue of General Standard on top of that column. The reason I point that out is in the background of the Vermont Brigade monument, there's another rise of ground. That's Culp's Hill. So that's the right flank of the Union line. General Lee's basic plan on July 2nd was to launch an attack all along the length of the Union line. General Richard Yore, one of his corps commanders, would demonstrate against Culp's Hill on the Union right and turn that into an actual attack when the opportunity presents itself. A long cemetery ridge itself to the north of us, that area is going to be attacked by troops 
from the core of AT Hill. And the main attack is to come down here with troops from the first core under the command of James Longstreet. How many of you were on Troy's uh, morning battle walk? <laughs> Some of you are talking about Captain Johnston. <laughs> and and there, Troy probably told you there is a debate as to where Captain Johnston went to on his reconnaissance. Some historians will tell you that, that make, it makes absolutely no difference where he went because he makes his report of that reconnaissance at between 7.30 and 8 o'clock in the morning. By the early afternoon, all that information is completely outdated by that time. And the Union Army is not where Lee thought it was. Based on Johnson's reconnaissance and other information, apparently both Lee and Longstreet thought the Union line ended here along the Emmitsburg Road Ridge and south of the Peach Orchard. So the original plan called for the division of Lafayette Bacall to form probably south of the Peach Orchard and then move north along the axis of the Emmitsburg Road, driving in the flank of the Union troops. Where Hood's division was supposed to go, we're not sure, because the attack doesn't come off the way it's planned. Across the road from us, you have Seminary Ridge, but that merges into a place called Warfield Ridge, where Longstreet's observation tower is located. As the troops are coming up here, the first division moving up is going to be McCaws' division, and leading the division is the brigade of Joseph Kershaw. When Kershaw gets to the area of Longstreet Tower, there was a stone wall. And he was directing his men over the stone wall to advance when they come under heavy fire. And Kershaw does a smart thing. He falls back to the other side of the wall and asks for direction. Because as McCaws himself is going to state, the situation up here was not what they were expecting. McClaws wrote to his wife, they were expecting to find maybe two regiments of infantry and one battery of artillery, maybe somewhere between 600 and 800 guys. Instead, what they find is over 5,000 infantry backed up by at least four batteries of artillery. So the whole plan now has to be changed. What time of day was that? Now? That's about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. It's a false start. Though. It's a false start, exactly. So McClaws starts to organize his four brigades, and an order comes up from Longstreet to press the attack. McClaws tells the courier, you know, the situation has changed, tell that to General Longstreet. Well, shortly after that, another courier comes up with orders for McClaws to advance. McClaws again tries to explain what's going on. The courier goes back, and now a third order from Longstreet comes up. And this time, it's a preemptory order for McClaws to advance. And McClaws felt the order had come from Lee somehow. Either Lee is going to agree with the order, or Lee gave the order himself. So at the time McClaws is getting ready to attack, Lee and Longstreet all together, somewhere on the reverse slope of Seminary Ridge. And then just as McClaws is getting ready to attack, another courier comes up from Longstreet telling him to wait and hold everything. Hurt's division is going to move behind you and strike further south. So now the Confederate artillery will start to open fire at about 3.30 in the afternoon. And Hood's attack is going to start at about 4 o'clock. Now, Hood himself protested three times to Longstreet, just like with Laws. And someone once reported that Longstreet, uh, just like his nickname namesake, 
is going to give three denials. You know, James Longsley, his nickname was Old Pete, or Peter. Yeah, you got that? Okay. So Hood now is going to start the movement with his entire division, and they're going to start to move forward. Hood's men were engaged the Union troops on the Round Tops, Devil's Den, and at least one brigade starts the first movement in towards the wheat field. From the cause of the divisions being held back under the orders of James Longstreet. Now, this is a case where Lee had told Longstreet if anything happened in McCaws' division, Lee was going to hold Longstreet responsible. And all this stems from Lee's observance of McCaws during the Battle of Chancellorsville. And he wasn't too impressed with McCaws. In fact, Lee wanted to replace McCaws uh, because of illness, is the way he's going to put it. But Longstreet wants to keep him in. So now Longstreet is basically going to take charge of the clauses division. So he's holding everybody up. But finally, once Hood's division is fully engaged, Longstreet will issue orders for Kershaw's brigade to start their advance. And now Kershaw, along with Longstreet, will lead his brigade over Stone Wall towards the south end of the Peach Orchard. He's actually going to go past the Peach Orchard, heading for the Rose Farm and a place called the Stony Hill. Kershaw later wrote when he launched his attack, the drums beat for the advance, and he was under the impression that William Barksdale, right beside him, was also going to advance. So Kershaw was quite surprised when he finds out he's advancing on his own with no support from Barksdale. But that also apparently is in accordance with the wishes of the Corps commander, James Longstreet. Now, William Barksdale himself was born in 1821. He is not a professional soldier. He was a lawyer and an editor. He is going to serve, he did serve in the second Mississippi in the Mexican War. But that regiment saw little or no action in the war itself. From 1853 until January 12, 1861, when he resigned, he was one of Mississippi's representatives in the United States House of Representatives. There is a story that when Representative Preston Brooks of South Carolina attacked Senator Charles Sumner from Massachusetts, Barksdale was standing by to make sure, help make sure nobody interfered. So that's just part of his reputation. There's also a story that Barksdale wore a wig, at least on occasion. And one time after the, the Brooks Sumner incident, there's almost a free for all in the House of Representatives between Northern representatives and Southern representatives. And in the midst of this, the story is Barksdale lost his wig. And when he put it on, he put it on backwards. And both sides got such a laugh out of it, it stopped the fight. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's the story. Now, he's also the, the older brother of Ethelbert Barksdale. And both brothers would attend the Democratic Convention in Charleston, South Carolina in 1860. And one historian described them as two Mississippians of fiery temper. When the war breaks out, Barksdale is appointed colonel of the 13th Mississippi in May of 1861. He'll lead that regiment at the first battle of Bull Run and during the Peninsula Campaign, where he'll assume temporary command of the brigade. And then on August 12th, he's promoted to Brigadier General and given command of the Mississippi Brigade. Their most famous exploit after that is helping to guard the lower town of Fredericksburg. Now, as the Union troops are trying to lay a pontoon bridge, Barksdale's guys are shooting at them, trying to stop the making of the bridge. As a result, Union troops had to be ferried over in pontoon boats 
landed and chased Bart those guys out of there. That's the only way to clear them out. Bart Snow is also described as a large, heavy man with a light complexion and thin, light hair, which apparently he wore pretty about shoulder length. So he's going to stand out no matter where he is. And while they're way over there at one point, Bart Snow said to Longstreet, I wish you would let me go in, I wish you would let me go in, General. I would take that battery in five minutes because there's several Union batteries firing towards Barksdale's position, which is about five or 600 yards to the west of the Peach Orchard. So they're within easy range. Longstreet's response though was, wait a little, we will all be going in presently. And within a few minutes, Kershaw is going to be engaged again, this time backed up by Sims Brigade. And once those brigades are engaged, Longstreet through McCaws will send an order to Barksdale to start to advance. Barksdale is going to ride up to the head of his column, order all the regimental officers to march on foot. None of them are supposed to be riding. The only guy on a horse is going to be General Barksdale himself. And before they pushed off, he commented, the line before you must be broken. To do so, let every officer and man animate his comrade by his personal presence in the front line. Now, one reason it's speculated they were late getting started is both Barkstow and his support brigade, Wofford, got somehow mixed up among the batteries of Alexander's artillery battalion. And that's why they were a little late getting out. But when Barksdale attacks, it's going to be with, with force. Now, the 21st Mississippi on the right flank of the line is going to hit the Peach Orchard proper. Now, by that time, the troops on that end of the line, Union troops on that end of the line, have started to fall back. Because Kershaw and Sims have advanced to the Stony Hill, starting to drive up the Union troops there, and are threatening to get into the rear of the troops in the Peach Orchard. So they start to, to withdraw. Once they start to withdraw, the 21st Mississippi will head down towards the Trocial Farm with its famous encounter with Bigelow's battery. The other three regiments will start to come in at an angle. The first regiment they hit is the 114th Pennsylvania. Across the road from us, <coughs> massed around the Surfy Farm. The 73rd New York had been advanced up to this position, ready to fire. And they got their guns loaded and ready to fire. But they can't open fire yet because the 114th is in front of them. And you don't want to go shooting in your, in your comrades' backs. So they have to wait for the 114th Pennsylvania to clear their front. Once those guys are clear, the New Yorkers now will start to open fire on Barksdale's men at what is described as close range. But some of Barksdale's guys are also hitting the 73rd in the left flank. So the 73rd can't maintain its position here very long. And they start to pull back and rejoin their parent brigade on the other side of United States Avenue. And that's the direction Barksdale is now leading his brigade. He can't necessarily directly attack the troops of Andrew Humphrey's 2nd Division of the 3rd Corps, which is north of United States Avenue. Because if he moves directly north too far, he's only going to collide with Wilcox's brigade, which is next in line. So that's why Barksdale is veering off more towards the northeast. So Barksdale is heading in the direction, basically, of the Pennsylvania Memorial, leading the brigade all the way across the field and trying to encourage them the best way he can. But that also means he's now threatening Bruce's brigade on the backside of the Emmitsburg Road Ridge. 
Carr's brigade, the other brigade in Humphrey's division, is on the Emmitsburg Road Ridge itself, trying to take care of Wilcox's advance. Most of the Excelsior Brigade is going to start to leave the field, with the exception of the 120th New York, which is going to maintain its position on the field and then they're forced to withdraw. Also trying to put a break on Barksdale's advance is the 105th Pennsylvania, the Wildcat Regiment, whose monument is at the corner of United States Avenue and Demonsburg Road. They reportedly got charged at least three or four times Barksdale's brigade to have them be pulled off and back towards the Pennsylvania Monument. Because of pressure now from Barksdale on the left, Wilcox and also Lang's brigade to the north, Humphrey's division will also now have to start to fall back. So all the Union troops here on the Peach Orchard and north of us along the Emmitsburg Road Ridge will have to start to fall back towards the Pennsylvania Monument. And as they get close to the Pennsylvania Monument, Freeman McGill is trying to put an artillery line together. General Hancock's going to send in the 1st Minnesota to try to take care of Wilcox's brigade. But also coming onto the field is the New York Brigade, uh, nicknamed the Harpers Ferry Coward. And they are trying to reclaim their reputation from having surrendered at Harpers Ferry to Stonewall Jackson in September of 1862. And I don't want to steal too much from John, because that's what he's going to talk about. I can tell you this much. As they get close, well, let me, let me back up once. When the brigade started to advance, Colonel Humphreys of the 21st Mississippi reported that 1,400 rifles were grasped with firm hands. And as the line officers would hear the command, forward march, the men sprang forward and 1,400 voices raised the famous rebel yell, which told the next brigade that the Mississippians were in motion. So just by the rebel yell, they're telling everybody where they're going. Now, I probably won't take too much away from John, but I will, because I will tell you, during the advance towards the Pennsylvania Monument, William Barksdale is going to be shot and mortally wounded. Reportedly hit at least three times. He's taken back to the farmhouse of the Hummerball farm just beyond the Pennsylvania Monument, where he's going to pass away in the front yard of the Hummerball house. It took the family some time to make all the proper arrangements, but by January of 1867, the general's remains have been removed from Gettysburg and taken back to Jackson, Mississippi. And that's where the general rests today. Just to give you a breakdown here of, of what the, of the damage the Mississippians caused, the 114th Pennsylvania came into battle with 259 officers and men. They report total losses of 155, almost 60%. The 73rd New York came in with 349 officers and men. They lost 162, about 46%. And the 120th New York came in with 383 officers and men. They lost 203, about 53%. Barksdale's entire command of 1,620 officers and men lost a total of 747 officers and men, almost 46%. So they actually did create more casualties on their opponents than what they suffered. And there is a weird military action that if you can punish the enemy more than they punish you, you've won. So based on that criteria, you could say the Mississippians won in their attack on July 2nd. I'm just about two minutes short. Uh, does anybody have any questions at this point about anything I mentioned or didn't mention?
Well, anything that's so confusing? Gilbert's gun line, how far? McGilvery's gun line is going to be beyond those two guns. Uh, it's basically along North Hancock Avenue. It's that, it's, it is that far back? Yeah, it's between United States Avenue. It's basically between United States Avenue and the Pennsylvania Monument. And that's where his line's going to be on July 3rd as well. Okay? Is it Technically, no. Watson's Valley is the one overrun by the Mississippi, exactly. but it wasn't technically part of McGilvery's line. They just happened to end up there. Bigelow is from the artillery reserve, and right, and that's where McGilvery saw as a lieutenant colonel. So, a lieutenant colonel asks you to sacrifice your men, you're probably not going to say no. And, and McGilvy also took the time to explain to Bigelow why he needed his battery to sacrifice himself. And that's all Bigelow needs to know. Uh, so for an artillery regiment in his first battle, uh, Bigelow's men really came up to the line. What was the other map, the fifth map? Who was that under? And was that that's Woolcock. That's from the fifth corps. Yeah. South Carolina? Kurtz are South Carolina, uh, Barstow's Mississippians, both Sims and Walkers are Georgia VA. Okay, well, I want to thank you folks for coming. We have plenty of time to make John to the Pennsylvania Memorial.